I really couldn't think of a more appropriate comment and idea to kind of transition into um, my uh, presentation. Um, you know, I think, uh, I've, I mean, I've been so inspired by today and thank you to, to all the guests and speakers and, and, and to everybody for their contribution. I, I feel, you know, I'm gonna leave this room with lots of ideas um, that we can move to impact. I feel like we're all agents of change um, here. Um, so in line with some of the conversations that we've been having, um, particularly uh, this afternoon, I wanted to spend the next 30 minutes or so um, talking about the role that entrepreneurs, or entrepreneurship, and more specifically entrepreneurs, the role that we can play um, in contributing to peace um, and uh, prosperity. And so to do this, I'm going to celebrate three agents of change, three um, principled leaders, um, uh, three peacemakers um, that uh, I have uh, been honored to meet uh, during my time at MIT. And I, 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 I'm gonna celebrate their stories, but I'm also going to try and tease out some of the leadership traits that we've all kind of been mentioning over the last <laughs> um, uh, uh, few hours. Um, and then I also want to, um, I'm going to end my presentation by kind of teasing out the role that entrepreneurship educators can play um, in uh, inspiring and educating change agents. Um, but first, I did want to just introduce myself uh, briefly. Um, so I'm the executive director of the Legatum Center, and essentially what I do is I'm, I'm dedicated to serving entrepreneurs who are building and scaling businesses in emerging markets. Um, I'm also uh, the senior, a senior lecturer at MIT, which, which means that I'm very, very interested in the role that we as entrepreneurship educators can play in driving that change and educating uh, people on the values and also the giving, equipping entrepreneurs with the skill set that they can take with them to build successful and principled uh, businesses. I'm also mother um, to this wonderful little girl here and I feel like a, a introductory slide is just not a, um, doesn't uh, represent me without showing my family. Um, and with that, I did want to just uh, tell a short story myself. So this conference uh, reminded me of a letter that I'm actually writing to my little girl, Penelope Penny. Um, and it's inspired by a very cheesy YouTube video that you may or not have seen, um, where I asked my family and friends to write a letter to Penny for her second birthday um, that I'm going to open on her 18th birthday, um, rather than a gift. Um, we have way too many plastic toys. Um, so I've received letters from, from near and far, from grandparents, from aunts and uncles, from cousins. But interestingly, I've actually found it quite hard to write a letter myself. Um, and why, and I think it, despite only being a mum for two and a half years, um, I feel like I've got so much to share, um, so much advice that I want to give my little girl. And you know, my ultimate goal is, is for her to be happy and for her to inflict happiness on others. And I think, you know, the speakers we've heard from today have certainly, you know, are achieving uh, that goal. But what framework and values do, can you teach a young child to, so that they can kind of embed that and, and, and make it their purpose to, to um, follow this dream. So I actually, when I received the invitation uh, to come and speak, I, I was excited because it, it, it kind of, the light switch went off and I thought, wow, you know what, I work with these amazing change agents every single day at my job with MIT and seeing these entrepreneurs go and build and scale incredible businesses around the world. How about using that as an opportunity to uh, share some lessons for my daughter. So with that, I'm gonna start with this story about Joseph. Joseph is from Northern Nigeria, the same town where 276 females were kidnapped by the Boko Haram uh, in 2014. And he came to Lagos, Nigeria, in, in search of a better life for himself and his family. I met Joseph uh, while visiting uh, Nigeria, Lagos, uh, this summer. 
And I was visiting a company called Max. Max is a startup based in the Yaba region, for those of you who have been to Lagos, a very cool place. Um, and what essentially Max is, is they're a last mile delivery company. So what that means for a restaurant that's in Lagos City, they will call Max and Max will deliver that product, that, uh, um, some hot food, to um, a hungry person on the other side of the city. What that means for a bank is that they'll call Max and they'll ask Max uh, to deliver a uh, bank card securely to a customer. What that means for an individual is that I can send cash to a friend um, in a secure and safe, um, safe way. And by meeting, but what blew me away when meeting Joseph, who works for Max and who's a delivery driver for Max, is that Max is far more than just a company serving restaurants and banks and e-commerce companies in, in Lagos City. You know, I would say that from the inside, you could, be, you could be in Silicon Valley. It looks like a typical startup. Post-it notes on the wall, ramen noodles in the cupboard. You overhear sales calls. You overhear computer scientists discussing the next cool algorithm uh, that they plan to build. And then when you step outside, you see and realize the, the scale of the challenge that Max is trying to solve. For anyone who's been to Lagos, you can probably, this picture is probably very familiar to you. It takes three to four hours to drive 20 kilometers. And there's a, this is a city that's urbanizing at record speeds. 21 million citizens currently live in Lagos and 80 people arrive per day to seek opportunities. And at the moment, there are not enough jobs. And we've talked about the importance of jobs and how that can lead to um, uh, disaster. And so what is Max doing to help solve this problem? Well, they're actually tackling this challenge in a very innovative way because last mile delivery in Lagos doesn't just mean that I get hot food in 30 minutes. That means that small micro businesses across the city can reach more customers. That means that their existence depends on better infrastructure within the city of Lagos. And so what they're doing is providing it's a very simple innovation, motorcycles around the city so that they can weave around traffic, innovative kind of boxes that keep food warm and, and, and bank cards safe, champions, their motorcycle drivers who um, uh, do the deliveries. And there's incredible incentives in, involved and engaged. The picture of Joseph I showed you, he was wearing a very cool jacket, um, a leather jacket. He was so proud to be a motorcycle driver for Max. And this is in a place where motorcycle driving is the, one of the worst professions that you can go into. It's disrespected. Many people can get licenses regardless of their ability to drive. Um, it's not like Uganda where you can just, you jump on a boda boda and you can go wherever you want. Um, and so what Max has done is brought respect to a profession. How have they done that? They've created psychometric testing for the drivers, these smart algorithms that link the psychometric tests to the way that the motorcycle drivers drive. They've created, they've used technology to create route optimization around the city. Google Maps isn't a thing there in the same way that it is here or in Boston. They've also created um, a system for geotagging addresses. So this means that, so in Lagos, addresses, again, aren't, they don't exist in the same way as they do here. So Max, when they finally discovered where to deliver a package, they geotag and they collect that data. So they're literally building a map of Lagos from uh, the bottom up. And I'm telling this story because this represents what entrepreneurship is all about. There is a human element to it and an economic element. There is human impact and there's economic impact. There's the world-class training that Max provides the motorcycle drivers. The health and safety, they provide helmets for every single driver that's part of their network. They pay two times the income 
They provide career growth, um, zero percent loans. That means that Joseph, in one year's time, will own that motorcycle driver. And I talked to the founder, he doesn't care if, Mac, if, if Joseph leaves the company after that. He can use that motorcycle to, to taxi people around and to provide more income for himself and his family. They provide health insurance. These, the founders are principled leaders that have built, they don't have to do this, but they've built this, the infrastructure into the business because number one, it makes business sense. You want to tr be able to trust the champions that deliver your packages, but they also care. They're mission-driven entrepreneurs. On the economic side, $1 million in sales last year, 20% growth month to month, and that's leading to 100 jobs these guys have existed for two and a half years. A hundred jobs already created in Lagos, 6,000 indirect jobs created. Those are the small to medium-sized businesses that they're serving and helping to deliver their products. And that means 50,000 lives already impacted by one, actually two, because they're co-founder entrepreneurs. I'm not gonna go into the founder's story, but I did just wanna highlight the path that Adateo Bomadaro, the founder of Max, took. He grew up in, in Lagos. You know, we were talking about understanding a problem. He had, he's identified and been, experienced this problem with, from within Lagos. He did come to MIT um, to, to pursue his entrepreneurial dreams. And in, in between, he worked for the oil sector, where he became increasingly frustrated by the wealth of the oil sector and the 99% of the GDP going directly to the 1% and wanted to change that and saw entrepreneurship as an opportunity um, to do that. Um, my second story is about Veronica. Veronica is on the, uh, the right here. Um, Veronica lives in uh, Kibera, which is one of the largest slum communities in Nairobi, Kenya. And um, she is one of two million people uh, within, uh, within the slums of Kenya alone. And she's a sales manager for a company called Soko. Soko is an ethical fashion brand. I'm actually modeling some of their jewelry today. Um, but Soko is, is not just a fashion brand. What they do is they work with artisans across the slums of Nairobi, artisans who are highly skilled in making handmade brass jewelry. And what Soko does through a simple mobile phone is connect these artisans with designers in San Francisco who know the market in America. Um, and they, they send through this kind of smart ERP system the designs to these artisans across, you're talking 2,500 artisans across Nairobi, decentralized, um, and they send the designs, they can make payments through these, the, the, the mobile phone, and with that, they're able to create these beautiful handmade designs at competitive costs to other jewelry makers. Now, from the, what the consumer sees, what you and I would see, is this beautiful ethical brand, Soko. Um, beautiful handmade jewelry that's usually sold for hundreds of, hundreds of dollars, and believe me, it's, it is affordable. Um, what On the back end, you see this virtual factory. And what I mean by that is this decentralized um, group of artisans across Nairobi who, have, who are able to connect with these designers through mobile phone. But what Veronica sees is what's most important. Veronica sees 25% of the revenue that is created from, my, from me buying this necklace. Now, let's put that into perspective. The average fair trade company gives 5% back to the artisan, Soko 25%. This is revenue, this is not profit, this is revenue. And, that, and, and let's remember that the average uh, amount that goes back to the artisan is less than 1%. Retail accounts for about one-sixth of the jobs on our, on our planet. And the average earning for a, a factory worker working in a retail company in uh, China is about 50 cents a day. So you can see that Soko has, they're not just an ethical fashion brand, they are literally changing the way we're thinking about the manufacturing 
of this jewelry through a decentralized system. And it's not just Veronica that they're impacting. There are hundreds of people now. There are 85 people who work directly for SoCo and their team. This is a picture that I took when I was visiting them this summer the baby shower that they were hosting for one of their employees. People like to work for SoCo, from the artisans like Veronica to the people on their sales team, uh, the founders, all female, three female co-founders are dedicated to training women within the company. Veronica is actually one of the few females who, who started with SoCo because most of the people that they were working with originally, most of the artisans were male who had been trained by nonprofits in the city to make brass jewelry. But through SoCo's dedication to capacity building, internal capacity building, they were able to train people like Veronica who, by the way, is now a sales manager, and, and they've literally brought her out of poverty and her family. And Ella here um, had, had a similar journey to Teo. Ella's the founder. She was driven by passion, committed to solving this problem of, of helping these artisans in Nairobi, and has now been living in Nairobi for um, five years. And within five years, They've made $25 million in revenue. Last year, they made $3.5 million alone. And by the way, 5%, only 5% of women founders end up making more than a million dollars in revenue. And Ella has made $3.5 million already in the last year. And it's through her mission-driven, um, uh, through her mission-driven kind of driven effort that she's been able to kind of build this organization. My final story is about Mithala. She um, is from Monterey, Mexico. So we're moving from the continent of Africa um, to the country of Mexico. And she is one of 11 million people in Mexico that suffers from diabetes. Um, without access to high quality care, Mithala was very close to su committing suicide. And this was before she came across a company called Clinica Stalazuca um, that's based in Monterey, Mexico. Um, Javier, the founder, um, who's just visiting me last week, um, and I was so inspired by his model. He spent the last seven years building two clinics in, in Monterey, Mexico. And what he's done is taken an innovative approach to an old problem, which is healthcare. And what he's done is you arrive in a Clinica Stella Zucca, it's kind of like a pharmacy in, in a mall. You arrive, you say that you are interested in getting tested for diabetes, and then you kind of go to these stations. They check your feet, they check your eyes, they take a blood test. Then you move on to a nutritionist, and the nutritionist gives you advice on how and what food to eat. Then you move on to a doctor, and you spend only 10 minutes with a doctor, but that's all you need to get the drugs to go on and live a healthy life. Javier has created a business model around this where they charge a very low subscription fee for the year and he's able to provide incredibly high quality care for the fraction of the cost, in fact 70% less than what, what the government spends currently in, in, in Monterey for serving people with diabetes care. 45% of the people that come in and get his free screening stay with the Clinica Stella Zucca and pay the, the subscription fee, which allows him to sustain the business. The rest, they get the free screening, and then they go, and they go to the government clinics, and they, they get served there. But that is a win for Javier, because at least they've had the free screening, and they're able to access the care that they need. Javier now has, um, I mentioned that a year ago, he had got, he'd managed to get these two clinics in Monterey right. But within the last year, he's set up 11 clinics, and he's opening one clinic a year. And when I asked him to describe his business model, he literally said it's the McDonald's of healthcare. And he's right. You know, he's applied this very interesting model, the assembly line, to a service. And this is, he's serving low-income communities in, in, in Monterey. And the thing that he emphasized to me was this is high-quality care. This is better care than otherwise he could provide through any other method. 
Now, I've told three stories, but these stories represent many of the students that come through the Legatum Center. Legatum means legacy in Latin, and we believe that entrepreneurship creates a legacy for the individual to share their impact with the world. But I think the main point I'm trying to make here is that entrepreneurs like Javier, like Ella, like Teo, they're agents for change. And that's social and economic. You know, these entrepreneurs are not just addressing some of the greatest challenges of all time, um, as articulated by the SDGs, but they're creating jobs. Jobs that will drive people out of poverty. This is um, a chart that I pulled, this is US data, that shows net job growth over time. And this proves that jobs come from entrepreneurs. This proves that jobs come from new businesses, not corporates. So this is uh, net job growth over time. The dark blue represents jobs created by new businesses in the United States, entrepreneurs. The light blue represents corporates and large, large uh, institutions. And you can see that net job growth is coming from the next generation of, of entrepreneurial leaders. And I think more than that is they're building the underlying infrastructure to support social and economic development. They're creating platforms for change. Arateo, through Max, is not just creating his licensing program that is making, it, it, which is kind of at the core of what makes the business successful. He is now being approached by the government because the government wants to purchase his psychometric testing and his process for, for uh, motorcycle licensing to improve the way that the city provides licenses. Ella is providing training for artisans, asset financing so they can purchase better equipment. And they're building out their own studios, their art, art studios. They're, they're, li they're literally building the underlying infrastructure they're going well beyond what makes sense for just core profit. And they're not just creating jobs, they're creating good jobs. They're creating, they're, they're paying their employees fair wages, not just fair wages, but what's right. Um, they're paying three, five times more than the industry standard, not because there's any kind of business reason behind it, because it's the right thing to do. Um, they're providing health insurance when they don't have to. Helmets, each of their um, headquarters has 24 hour access to power and the internet that their employees can access any time. You know, these are um, principled leadership strategies that really make a difference because these are mission driven leaders. They don't just care about profit, although profit is important for them to keep their business sustainable, but the mission that, that profits drive the mission. The mission doesn't just, the mission isn't about the profits, it's about the profits driving the mission. And I think finally to kind of tie these entrepreneurs together is that they're building sustainable and scalable solutions. Entrepreneurship isn't about serving one patient, one artist, um, you know, one motorcycle driver. Entrepreneurship is about creating a sustainable way to have impact that will go beyond Ella, will be go beyond Teo, will be go, go beyond Javier if they, do, if they build the business in the right way. And I think this is what's important. And the, one of the points that I wanna make here is it's not about the entrepreneurship, it's about the entrepreneur behind the venture. Every enterprise, um, behind every enterprise is an entrepreneurial leader. And I've pulled out three leadership characteristics that I think represents Ella, Teo, and Javier. And actually, it's interesting because these themes have been brought up again and again today um, using just different words for the same thing. I would say purpose. They're all driven by a goal to make the world a better place. Ella's representing marginalized artisans. Teo wants to build a better Nigeria by creating the infrastructure that's necessary to help the business economic, the economy function. Javier wants to uh, cure everybody of diabetes in Mexico. And there were some other words that we used today that came up in conversation that represent the same thing. Inspiration, I think um, we mentioned, and um, 
identity. You know, this is all part of the same thing. It's, it's, it's this, this drive, this purpose, it's beyond yourself. Um, yeah, and so the second is principle. You know, I mentioned that these entrepreneurs aren't just creating jobs, they're creating good jobs. Capitalism has a bad name for itself because the, entrep the, the leaders behind some of these large corporations aren't thinking about why they're there and who they can help and how they can help. And I think these leaders, the new generation of leaders have this principled mindset where again, and I'm stealing a quote from, from John Mackey, the, the CEO, former CEO of Whole Foods. Um, and he said that it is about, you need to create a business where the uh, profits drive the mission the mission doesn't drive the profits. And I, I really do believe that. And I think that, that the entrepreneurs today have that mindset. Um, and the final one is persistence. And again, we used a, um, another word that's come up again and again, resilience. Resilience and persistence. And, and, and this, with the, with the purpose in mind, that drives persistence. These entrepreneurs, Javier just shared with me, he was close to bankruptcy four times over the last four years, but he kept going because he had this larger purpose in mind. So to kind of move into the last part of, of, of what I wanted to share with you today, the question that we ask ourselves at MIT and as ed entrepreneurship educators is how do you build the values, these principled values and morals and ethics and the skills to help entrepreneurs succeed? Um, how do you build this into the curriculum and, and the workshops that we run on the ground for entrepreneurs to to help the entrepreneurs find their way. And I think that there are kind of three pieces that I've pulled out of what we do at MIT, um, and I've seen it all around the world that I, I wanted to kind of touch on. The first is discovery. And I think discovery ties very closely into purpose. You know, we as entrepreneurship educators have to commit time to helping our children and our students discover, and ourselves, discover purpose. And the way that we do that at the Legatum Center is, is by having a conversation, understanding, and this is another theme that's come up again and again today, is understanding the problem, understanding the customer, those you serve, and finding out what the, the crux of the problem is. And um, so we run events like the one we've got coming up in November around neglected tropical diseases and how we can help connect one, uh, several billion people with the drugs and the care that they need to wipe out these diseases on the planet. We host workshops. We send students to the field to spend multiple uh, weeks in testing uh, their products, doing primary market research, understanding the customer, finding ways to serve the community. The second thing that I think we do, that, that we, we pay attention to, obviously as an academic institution, is education. And um, we have this saying at, at, at MIT, and in the, particularly in the entrepreneurship community at MIT, which is give a man a fish and you'll feed him for a day. Uh, teach a man how to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. And I should probably switch out him for him and her because it's far more appropriate. Um, but, you know, I think that this statement resonates with, you know, I think it, it's, it, it's, it, it's, it's true, you know, and, and we've got data that shows that. This is, this is uh, data, um, the number of business or businesses that have been started by MIT alumni over time. And we've highlighted students who start businesses three years after graduation, five years after graduation, 10 years after graduation. And what we're finding is that the majority of successful businesses are founded five, 10 years after graduation, not during school, even though you, know, you may start something, as all entrepreneurs know, most first businesses fail, the second one may be okay, and the third one is the one that, 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 that ends up scaling. And here, what's important is not the commitment that we've made as entrepreneurship educators to the business, it's about the skills that they're developing. And I think that that is something that we've kind of embedded into our curriculum. It's about the entrepreneur, not the entrepreneurship. Um, so just a few ways that we're doing that at MIT. Um, 
is we're connecting our entrepreneurs with faculty and connecting them with frameworks for how to build strategies for, for building successful businesses, how to create good jobs, not just jobs, that make economic sense, business sense, but also moral and ethical sense. Um, we uh, run classes where we bring and celebrate entrepreneurial role models, um, something that's inspired me today. Um, and then we connect them with mentors um, so the final piece of this is uh, celebration, and I think that this, this is what today has been all about. Um, and again, we run big events to celebrate our entrepreneurs. We celebrate the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world too much. They're great companies, but what we really do need to do is be inclusive about the entrepreneurs that we celebrate, um, both events but also online. Um, so. I've got one more um, point to kind of end and or to, to close. Um, I did start writing my letter to Penny, and I won't read the whole thing to you, um, but I think this might capture um, some of the, the points that, that, I, that, that I've kind of mentioned today. So I start by saying so, and I actually should ask you to come and read it because you're far better at it. <laughs> but, uh, so, my lovely Penny, some advice for you um, that you may add to your depository of ideas and inspiration for the future. One is invest time in discovering and now and again reminding yourself of your purpose. Explore and experiment, expose yourself to the world and get to know the people who live within it and find something that you care about, something you're passionate about. No matter how big or small, do something that you believe in. Whether it's a question that you want answered, a person that you want to help, a community that you want to serve, this purpose will drive you, make you work harder, and make you stay more focused. It will, <laughs> it will keep you grounded and principled and help you fuel your persistence. Number two is commit to a lifelong learning. Invest in your education, your IQ and your EQ, so your human and intellectual capacity, and listen and learn from those around you, just as, as we've been talking about um, this afternoon. And to, to do this, to build not just your skill set, but your value set. Um, the better informed you are, the better your knowledge and experience toolkit, and the better equipped you are to serve your purpose if you invest in your education. And finally, um, on a more personal note, someone told me, Penny, someone told me recently um, when I had a moment of, of self-doubt, um, I'm too young for, to, to be doing this, um, I'm too inexperienced, I don't know what I'm doing, I'd had a really tough week and had to make some pretty tough decisions. Um, and she said uh, to me, she said, look what you're doing now and the impact that you're having. Um, but more importantly, look at what you're learning by being a part of this movement. And think about that in the context of what you'll be doing when you're 50 years old. And for me, that was kind of a game-changing piece of advice for someone to give me. Um, so, you know, touch one person's life today, 100 tomorrow, 1,000 um, over the course of a lifetime. Um, and, and I think that that's... Um, a uh, you know important uh, lesson for for us all. So, um, my final piece of advice for my daughter is enjoy the journey and keep smiling. <laughs> um, so, thank you, everybody.